Every day, millions and millions of people are looking for an answer to their question. They're looking for a solution for their problem. Every day, thousands and thousands of people, they're looking for your service, your product, your solution. They want to come to your website, but they don't. As Rand showed you yesterday, only 8% of people click on those beautiful ads you made. And only 36% on mobile and 62% on desktop are clicking on your organic search results. You did such a hard work to be on that page number one, but still people are ignoring you. But despite all that, every day people come to your website. They come to your website in the hope to become your customer. They have the intention to become your client. But they don't. They don't buy it. And they don't buy it because they don't buy your message. They buy somewhere else. The great Julius Caesar once said, I came. I saw and I won. When he would live today and he would visit your website, he would say, I came, I saw and I left. <laughs> like so many people that visited your website and they leave without any engagement. And there's only one person to blame and it's not the visitor and it's not him either. It's you. It is your fault. Because you don't fulfill the expectations of your visitor. You don't give them what they want. You don't give what they are looking for. You don't trigger your visitors. You don't conquer the heart and the minds of your visitors. And the main reason is that you give them the impression that you don't care. You don't care about your customers. Lots of companies They only seem to care about themselves. They only seem to care about their own business. And it's not only me that's saying that. This is a recent study. And the main reason why customers stop being a customer, or why they don't become a customer, is not because they die. Sometimes it happens, that's 1%. <laughs> But the main reason is because they have the feeling that you don't care about them, that you treat them as a number. And that's much more important than your pricing, maybe your competitor has a better product, or your not-so-good customer service. And I'm not saying that you should have a lousy product and a shitty customer service and sell it at outrageous prices, but it's very important that you care about your visitors. And that feeling, the feeling of caring about your customers won't be changed by technology. The feeling that you treat them as a number will not be solved with artificial intelligence. Because it's about being human. About being human as a company. And that is, should be part of your DNA, DNA. And it will never be the outcome of an algorithm. Lots of companies are investing shitloads of money now in personalization. Yeah! But what they don't understand is that personalization will only work when you have a good website. Most websites suck. If you do personalization on a shitty website, you know what the result is? That every single user now has a personalized shitty experience. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Damn, that was too late. Now, most of you are SAO and SAA people, so I don't know if you're familiar with what we call the UX pyramid of needs, and this is my take on it. And there are some fundamental layers, and the first layer is, does it work? Does my website work? Is it accessible? And this seems like, no, nah, but one out of four websites, they do have problems with browser device compatibility. And then the next step is, can I find what I'm looking for? And this is on the website itself, so it has to do with site structure, it has to do with the internal search engine, and it has to do with the building blocks on your pages, the home page, category page, product page. Can people use your website? Do they understand your message? Does it trigger them? Does it persuade them? And if all those layers are okay, then maybe then 
You can start as the cherry on the cake with personalization. But what's missing on all these UX pyramids of needs is that one fundamental layer, that layer, does the company care about me? If you don't have that layer, don't do marketing, don't have a website, because you will go bankrupt anyway. It's a lovely talk for a good morning, isn't it? <laughs> now, let me be very clear. If you have bullshit copy on your website, voice search will give bullshit answers to the customer. If your copy doesn't convey the visitor, that is the first thing you have to fix. Because yes, these new technologies, voice AI, personalization, they will make it only clearer, more obvious, that your message sucks. Oops, damn, that was too fast. And I'm not saying that all these technologies are shit. No, 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 they're good. But a fool with a tool remains a fool. And you should use these technologies and then they are a blessing with a clear goal in your mind, and that is to make the life of your customers better. Their lives, not your life, the life of your customers. To take away frustration and to fulfill their needs and their dreams. And this is not something new, it's been always like that. Since the age of the dinosaurs. Okay, maybe not. Sorry for those who believe in creationism. Dinosaurs and humans, they never lived together. But since the invention of fire, the domestication of animals, the wheel, the written word, the printed word, the steam engine, the combustion engine, telephone, light bulb, radio, television, internet, all these inventions and many, many more, they have changed the way we interact with each other as humans and they have changed the way we do business with each other. And I think for every of these and many more inventions, there were always businessmen and women who thought, oh shit! <laughs> and they didn't adapt. And yes, their companies were wiped out. But there were other men and women who thought like, wow! And they embraced the new technologies and they used it to make their customers happier. From this businesswoman in ancient Rome to her modern-day counterpart, and even this guy, who ultimately is doing exactly the same thing, but on a slightly larger scale, they understand that there is one thing that is very important to run a successful company, and that is that you have to start from the customer. You need to put the customer at the center of everything what you do. Otherwise, you will die. Now, some of you might be thinking, hey, hey, cattle, that's not true, man. You know that it's digital transformation, it's digital disruption that is killing companies. Carol, don't you know these numbers? 52% of all companies that were in the Fortune 500 in the year 2000, they have disappeared. Yeah, I know that number. It's from 2014, and it's very strange. In 2016, the CEO of Accenture said on the World Trade Forum suddenly that it's digital that is the main reason. Ooh, out of the blue. No proof whatsoever, but it sounds good. And Gartner does something similar. 40% of all companies will be wiped out the next five years due to digital disruption. No proof whatsoever. And then there's this number. Who the average stay of companies in the standards and poor 500. It used to be 61 years in 58, and now it has dropped to 18 years. And all this to digital disruption. Is it? No proof. You should know that the companies that spread these numbers, they're consulting agencies. They live from fear. Fear is what drives customers in their hands. And if we have this last series of numbers, there's one important number missing. In 1980, the number had already dropped to 25 years. There was no internet. There was no digital disruption. 
And this guy, Brian Anderson, is doing a great job at busting all these myths. And apparently, the most important reason why you can show these numbers is because of the composition of the indexes, the standards and poor, and the Fortune 500. The, the way they compose it is completely different. So these numbers are bullshit numbers. And it, it's not digital that is killing companies. For the last 100 years, there's one common theme when companies fade away, and that's because they lose the connection with their customer. And you probably all know the story of Kodak, but I'm going to tell you it again, because maybe you don't know it as it is. Because Kodak started as a very, very customer-centric company. Their first slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. Ta-da! They were in the business of collecting memories, special moments, the Kodak moment. And they did a great job. They had 90% of the film business, and film was the means to achieve that goal. In 75, they invented a digital camera, and they never commercialized it. Because, oh, then we will lose our film business. But that means that they lost the connection with the customer, and they now turned to their own business. They only focused on the business. They had forgot that film was just the means to achieve that goal of, hey, we do the rest, and you can share those memories. Because the digital camera took away one of the biggest frustrations. It's like, okay, I press the button, and then, damn, I have to wait. Uber has not become big because of the sharing economy. That's bullshit. They became big because they took away lots of frustrations with customers of traditional taxi companies. How do I hold a taxi? How do I call it? How long do I have to wait? Where is it? Can I pay with a credit card or no? How much will it cost? Those were all fears that people had. And they solved it, and that's why they became successful. There are many, many, many stories like that, and I really recommend these two books, one with my good friends, Jeffrey and Brian Eisenberg, Be Like Amazon. The other one, Simon von, sorry, from Simon Sinek, Start with the Why. And there are lots of stories, and it makes it very clear that companies, and you know it like Amazon, Netflix, Zalando, Booking.com, Airbnb, they became big because, yes, they are customer-centric, but also, and that's the main reason, because they took away frustration. They took away frustrations that the companies that already served those markets in those days didn't see anymore because they went from customer-centric to business-centric. And I'm 100% convinced that the main reason or the biggest threat to any business is that you stop being customer-centric. Now, the problem is that whenever I say that, there are three objections. And number one is cattle. <laughs> we are already customer-centric. And indeed, there was a study by Bain and Company, and they surveyed lots and lots of companies, and indeed, 80% of all companies say, yes, we are customer-centric. But when they asked their customers, only 8% of them agrees. So there is a big gap between what companies think that customer-centricity is and what clients think that customer-centricity is. So the question is, how do you close that gap? How do you overcome the disconnect between you and your customer? And the answer is an in-depth knowledge of your customer. And then we have objection number two, the marketing manager. Oh, Carl, we already know so much about our customers. And I'm always interested, so I say, okay, tell me all about it. And then they bombard me with lots and lots of social demographic crap. The average household income, the car they drive, the family, the social situation, blah, blah, blah. And when I asked the marketing manager, like, interesting, but how does this help you to convert the searcher into a visitor, the visitor into a customer, the customer into a loyal customer? They're like, I don't know. <laughs> and when I asked the questions that really matter, they have no answer. Why? Do people buy from you? What is their motivation? Why, why do they become your customer? Why do they buy again? And why don't some people buy from you? What's holding them back? 
And when they start to search or when they arrive on your website, what do they already know? What is their starting point? What is the explicit and the implicit motivation of your customers? What are their emotions with your products? When I ask these questions to marketing people, they're like... <laughs> Objection number three. Yeah, Carol, but we already collect customer feedback. And indeed, and that's, that's a very good thing. 95% of all companies collect customer feedback. I should be happy with that, because I am a user researcher. But the problem is that only 50% of companies inform their staff about it, and only 30% turns those insights from the customer feedback into decisions. That's still kind of OK. But then, <laughs> Only 10% of companies put those decisions into real actions. So there we are. Customer centricity, my ass. All right, enough doomsday scenarios. Let's go for the solutions. How can we conquer the hearts and the minds of our visitors? And there are many methods out there. 16 people of you had a great opportunity <laughs> yesterday to follow my workshop, so they are aware of most of them. But I'm going to, for this talk, I'm going to pick one of which I'm really convinced that most of you can apply it immediately and also profit from it immediately. And I call it targeted surveys. And a targeted survey is about asking the right question at the right time. And it is really about question, not questions. It's one question, maybe two. So not a classical survey with 10 or 20 questions, because that's crap. And we ask the question at the right time. Can be one question when somebody enters your website or a product page. Can be when somebody leaves a certain page, the shopping cart or a product page, without interacting with it. Can be after X amount of pages. Can be about scroll depth. Can be when after seven seconds of inactivity on the shopping cart page, whatever. But it's very, very targeted. And it's very important that you know what you want to achieve with that question. You all know these kind of, hello, Carl, how are you? Fine, thank you. So you all know these little slide-ups, that's good. Minor point of it is that response rate is most of the time less than 1%. So that's what, why we still like the in-the-face pop-up questionnaires. Like this one, this is on the Yoast, the Yoast.com uh, website. We had 10,000 answers in one week. That's not bad. And we recently started experimenting with integrating forms on pages. This is a thank you page on Carglass, Autoglass in the UK. After somebody makes a booking, so we integrated the survey, and the response rate is 65%. Bam. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Now, when it's about questions, it's important that you ask a question that is not an opinion. Don't ask questions about future behavior. So don't ask questions, do you like our website? <laughs> if we would change this, would you use it? How likely is it that you would recommend us to blah, blah, blah? Because, sorry to disappoint you again, my friends, this does not exist. Nobody can predict the future. Past behavior is the best prediction of future behavior. All right, time for some examples because you're falling asleep. But first, I want to do a little quiz. I'm going to show you two variations of uh, the homepage of Carglass, and I'm going to ask you what variation do you think led to more people making an appointment. Those who've seen this before, you are not allowed to answer. This is the first version of the homepage. As you can see, it is a rather text-heavy version. Lots and lots of information. And one of the things we found out while working for Carglass was that 68% of all people that come to the website, come to the website to make an appointment to fix the chip in their windows. And this is the second version of the homepage. I call it the Zen version. Focus on that one call to action. Mark nu een afspraak. Make your appointment now. So the question is easy. I think the answer is easy too. Which version do you think led to more people making an appointment? I'm not leaving the stage before everybody has voted, so now we need some interaction. Munich! Thank you. <laughs> Are you all awake? So, who's voting for the text-heavy version? 
Uh, who's voting for the Zen version? So that must be about 97% versus 3%. Cool. Let's get this party started. <laughs> Although maybe it is not a party, because 97% of you had it wrong. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I will explain why and which method we used in about 20 minutes or so, I guess I have. Yeah. But first, how can you use this? And how can you use this also for SAO and SAA? SAO, SAA, yeah. So, one of the primary things I always like to find out is why are people looking for a solution? And I have the impression that a lot of marketing and communication people, they search it way too far, and they forget sometimes the primary motivation. So, so this is a website where they sell car parts, it's some text, some images, there's a call for action, so it's blah, kind of okay. But when I read the text, oh, sorry, it's in French, there are things like um, a special treatment of the epoxy glass or polycarbonate glass, I think that's a German word. Ooh, polycarbonate, yeah, sehr gut. Um, <laughs> Jawohl. Oh, sorry, don't make German jokes, Carl. I'm oh, sorry. Um, and then it's like a 10-year uh, rust-free guarantee. And when I read a text like that, I'm always like, is that why people want to buy a carport so they can go to their neighbor and say, ha-ha, I have a special treat at epoxy glass. Duh. I'm not sure. But I'm not the client. I'm not the consumer. So I just do that one question survey on the website. Hey, why are you looking for a carport? And we also send out a survey with one question to everybody who had bought a carport the last six months. And we asked, hey, if we would tear down your carport tomorrow, what would you miss the most? Isn't that a lovely question? It's shocking. But because this is not the average marketing question, more than 70% of people answered. And they said things like, oh no, then I have to scrape the ice from my windshield in winter again. And oh no, then I have to get into a bloody hot car in summer. And then I have to unload my groceries in the rain again. And I, I never realized it, but now I only have to go to the car wash once a month or every two months, and it used to be every week. Nobody said anything about, oh, I will miss the special treat at the epoxy glass. Nobody said, oh, I will miss the fact that I was still entitled of nine years and six months of rust-free guarantee. <laughs> and exactly this inputs, the answers from the survey we used on the new landing page. And the new landing page is a new design, but it's not about the outer layer of the design, the visual layer of the design. It's about the psychological buildup of the page. Because that first bullet list is not about the product. It's about the client. Are you tired of scraping the ice from your windshield in the morning? Are you tired of getting into a sweltering hot car? Are you tired of unloading your groceries in the rain? Do you know what this list does with the visitor? What they literally do behind the screen? They start nodding. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's why I'm looking for a carport. This website understands me. I have found a new friend. I hope the friend part is not true, because then you have to seek help. <laughs> but the first part is true, the nodding. And there's something called the yes mood principle in psychology. So that's what we do here. And the result is that you're more open to suggestions later on because you're yes, 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 and the next thing you want to do is like, yeah. So you're like, yeah. Oops, that was too fast. I want to request a quote. That's kind of nice. OK, in this example, there are three principles. First, the yes mood, I just talked about it. Second one, and this is the one you can really use for you, is that you should understand that your customer, and especially your visitor and your searcher, who's even earlier in the customer journey, they don't care about you, they don't care about your company, they don't care about your products, they only care about themselves. How your solution can make their life better. That's what they're looking for. So that means that you need to zoom in on the problems and the situations of your visitor first. And my dear friends, until now, 
It were only marketing managers and designers who hated me, because I say, websites suck. From now on, you will hate me too, because it's my privilege to say, SEO people and SAA people, you suck. <laughs> this is the first result when I look for buy a car part in the UK. Buy a car part online and save on delivery fees. Allen's factory outlet. Allen's factory outlet loves himself. Has a wide variety of metal car parts for sale. Really, Allen? That's a good job, my friend. When you order a car part online with Allen's factory outlet, yeah, I love to repeat my name, you motherfucker. You have a choice of three <laughs> different roof styles. Yeah, woohoo, three different roof styles. <laughs> The three different styles are regular, boxed, even, vertical, roof, steel, car parts. <laughs> Fuck off! The second result, it's also Alan. <laughs> Consider the selection of metal car parts for sale at Alan's factory outlet. When you buy from us, you can choose who, who, the size of your metal roof. <laughs> Looking to buy a car part, steel garage, steel set, or metal barn? Yes, I'd look for buy car part! Carport.com has a wide selection of metal buildings of all types for delivery to your home or dot dot dot. Metal building case, metal garbage. <laughs> this is your visitor! <laughs> it's so strange that only 30% on mobile clicks on organic search results. So strange, yes, they're sleeping! Aber Karl, we sind in Deutschland! We sind zu viel besser! Really? Carport kaufen! <laughs> Carport online konfigurieren in two minutes to Ihren Carport. Erstellen Sie jetzt ganz einfach Ihr individuelles Carport mit unseren online calculator. Carport dot dot dot. And then, extensions. Carport News. <laughs> That's really what people want to do when they want to buy carport. Oh no, let me read news about carport first. Oh. <laughs> carport Beratung, Carport Online Calculator, Carport Prices, Standard Carports, Mass Einfertigen, 20 Online Rabatt, Kompetenter Service, Qualitätskontrolle, Bilder Carports, Carport Top Seller. Alu carport mit glas oder polycarbonate dag. <laughs> oh, schatz, finally I found it. The one with the polycarbonate dag. <laughs> so I was right, you suck. <laughs> so it's very important to understand it's not about only about bidding strategies. I don't know anything about SEA, by the way, so you're doing a great job, but to conquer the heart and the minds, you have to know these techniques and you have to put those things up front. The text is so important. So your German is much better than mine. These are the natural search results. I'm not going to read them out aloud because I still have to talk for 10 more minutes and I would fall asleep when I read them out aloud. But it's horror. It's blah, blah. Blur. Es ist scheiße! <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> this is someone who just read that page. They want to kill themselves. <laughs> third principle we used. There's a third one in the same example. Can you see what word we use all the time? You. Because it's about the customer. It's not about you as a company. Booking.com uses this principle all the time. This is the second step in the booking process of Booking.com. There's 27 times the page goes on and on and on that they use you. Your room, your booking details, you selected your booking, treat yourself, pay your way, your card, pay your entire booking. It's you, you, you. They make the customer the star of everything. They put the customer at the heart of everything they do. They sell 2.5 million bookings every day. You are not. <laughs> That's true. And they are from the Netherlands. <laughs> and they're from the Netherlands. <laughs> I'm from Belgium. All right. I know it's a funny animated GIF, but the reason why 
The you is so important is because in real life, you don't like people like this. You don't like people with the look at me syndrome. Yesterday during the breaks or at the network event, when you started talking to someone and they only t talk about themselves and they never ask a question back, you think, oh, what a prick. And that's what we have when we see an Edward, a Serp, a landing page that only talks about themselves and not about me as a customer. We don't like it. So how many times do you use ir, sie, oder was, ever? <laughs> Ta-da! The first one is doing great. Let's see how many times the other do it. <laughs> Oops. So room for improvement there. So that was my technique number one. Technique number two is slightly, no hard, very closely related. It's about frustrations. What frustrations do you solve in the eyes of the customer? And that's an important one. Because lots of companies, what they think are the major points of their products or services, it's not always the same as what their clients think are the major plus points of their products and services. This is a product called ClickShare. It helps you to wirelessly share a projector or a beamer in a meeting room. This is the page. It's kind of like <laughs> boring. So we did some user research. These are the questions we asked. What almost made you hesitate to buy our product and what problem did our solution solve for you? And people said things like, oh, no mess with cables anymore in the meeting room. We don't have to call IT anymore. And even that person that brings a MacBook into a meeting room and forgets his little connector. Why do you always forget your little connector, Mac people? Now they can share it on the central screen. And that person that even has an Android device, he can share it on the central screen. So based on this, we adapted the page. No mess with cables, no technical hiccups. We introduced the video with the six and the eight most asked questions to salespeople. And yes, it resulted in a big uplift in sales. Once again, you know the drill. You have to bring this earlier in the customer journey. Wirelessly screen sharing. Kinderman, click and show. Wirelessly screen sharing for conference rooms, classrooms, and huddle spaces. Full HD, 1080 up to 4K request demo here. Our setting dual band, NAC, Wi-Fi, AirPlay, full HD, 4K support. Really, is that what you do in your daily life? Ooh, we made an ad word. Yeah, it sucks. Look at the serves, it's horrible. Yeah, I fucking hell, man. The third one is kind of okay. I think it's a bit boring, but they say connects Windows, Apple, and Android. Then it's native screen mirroring, no apps or cables required. So they take away some of the fears that people had, but I think the copy could be better. But there's lots and lots of room for improvement there. Another example of this technique, this is Yoast SEO. This is the page that we wrote for them about upgrading to premium. Yoast told us a lot of things, that's interesting. But then we started doing our user research and we asked people, hey, what convinced you the most to buy the premium version? And one of the things we found out is that, and that's often what often happens, is that the order in which Yoast talks about the features is not the same order in which consumers talk about it. In the Yoast version, the second one is like redirect manager. Nobody talked about the redirect manager when we did the survey. People said, oh, it's a good thing that I don't have dead links anymore. Because they don't know what a redirect manager is. So in our version, it's only at place four. We don't call it redirect manager, but no more dead links. And that's one of the reasons you should do those surveys, because you have to know the real terminology, the words of your customers. That's what you do with your keyword research, but your keyword research won't give you it in so much detail as the survey. So it's a very good way of really understanding your customer. This alone, uplift of 23% in sales. So start from the customer. Last one. Not only focus on why do people buy from you, but very important, why don't they buy from you? What's holding them back to become a client? Another Yoast example, so that's the page we had in the previous test. And here we asked a question on the page for everybody who did not click on Get Yoast SEO Premium now. And the survey was, or the question was, what's holding you back to upgrade to the premium version? And one of the top answers was, I'm not sure, but I did a lot of work in the free version already and, and configuration and, and, and all that stuff. 
do I need to do it again or, or not? So based on that input, we adapted one line on the page. That's the one in the green, and it says, all plugin settings will be automatically migrated to Yoast SEO Premium for you. So you keep all the work you've already put into your free plugin. Ooh, we used the you four times. And we took away some pain, we took away fear. This one sentence alone, 9.2% more sales. It's very important. What is the barrier? What are the frustrations? What is keeping people to buy from you? And now finally, why, oh why, did that text-heavy version win? Well, when Carglass became our client, this was their homepage. It's a good homepage. And it indeed, it focuses on make your appointment now, which indeed is the top task of 68% of all visitors. But one of the things we saw was that not 68% of all visitors made an appointment. So there was a difference between what people wanted to do on the website and what they really did. So the solution is an exit survey for everybody who doesn't make an appointment. And we ask them, what is the main reason you're not making an appointment today? And then people said, hmm, do you give any guarantee on your work? And if you replace my window, is it the same quality as if I would do it with an official car dealership? If I have a BMW, is it a BMW, BMW window or is it a cheap Chinese copy? Sorry, Chinese people. It's early in the morning, I'm sorry. Number three of, of the objection, number three, do I have to arrange things with the insurance company first, or do you do it? And do I need to pay Carglass first and then try to get my money back from the insurance company? So there was a lot of doubts, a lot of fears that people had. And that's why the text-heavy version is the winner. Because if you would have read it, it counterattacks the fears, it counterattacks the barriers that people have, it takes away their pain, it takes away their doubts, and that's why this is a winner. And once again, my advice for you, do this earlier in the customer journey. Integrate this kind of things in your AdWords, in your PPC ads on Facebook. Integrate it in your SERP results. It, it's so important. And I'm not going to read them again, but it's like blah, blah, blah. Look at the second one. This is Autoglass UK. They're not a client. It's, it's only Belgium. But it's like at Autoglass trademark, <laughs> we are proud of our repair first promise where we fuck, fuck, fuck. It should be you, not we. So adapt it, change it, make it attractive. So the conclusion is easy. How to survive in the age of technology? <laughs> Focus on the customer. I'll have the right attitude. Ask the right questions. And I hope I made it clear. Don't trust your gut feeling because you were wrong. You choose for the easy the one that's easy for the eye. And that's what a lot of designers and marketers still think, that clarity is about minimalism. No, clarity is about a clear message. And sometimes you have to have more than one word to have a clear message. This is clarity too. And that means that you should never ever ask, <laughs> oh yeah, blah, 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 that you, never, that you have to start selling the way people want to buy your stuff and stop selling the way you want to sell your stuff. And never ask the question again, what is the goal of my website? What do I want to achieve? The right question is, what do my customers, what do my visitors want to achieve? What is their goal? That's so, so important. And then your customer will not look like this anymore, but like this. You have a happy customer. And whatever your job role is, technical, non-technical, marketing, designer, content, copy, whatever it is, you have one single goal, and that is to make your customers happy. That's what we all have in common in this room. And I hope I made it clear that if you give your customers, your visitors, your searchers what they want, they ultimately will give you what you want. It's their customership and even more important, their customer loyalty. So from now onwards, fix the broken heart. Make sure that you care about your customers 
And every single day, ask yourself the question, do I make my searchers happy? Do I make my visitors happy? Do I make my customers happy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, did we make you happy with Carl? <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, thanks very much. But it was a completely new talk, so I'm happy that it went well, and I'm happy that <laughs> yeah. you liked it. So, and before you leave all, um, I have a last question, maybe. Oh, 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 huh? I said I don't like questions. Ah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no, go. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a talk before, and uh, I first said, Hi, hey, Carl, you're from Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, and the good thing is, from this talk, I learned now what uh, warum. That, oh, I improved my Dutch, <laughs> because warum is warum, right? Yes. Yeah. But uh, I have a final question, because we are a very tech-savvy um, uh, audience over here, and uh, why is it so difficult to talk about, well, it's so easy to talk about technology, yeah, about know. trends, about tools yeah. and all this stuff, and we love this. However, it's so hard to talk about customers. Why is it? I have no idea, but it's true. It's like most people, they, but even marketing people, they never talk to customers. They, they just work on graphs that they have. So, but it's very important. We work at the end. And if you're in an agency, I know the, the customer is the customer, but the real customer is the end customer. And you should do work with them because only then you can adapt your message. But it's so much safer and easier to sit behind your computer and to do some nerdy stuff. Yeah. But the nerdy stuff will only work when you know why you're doing it and from where you should go. Yeah. Super. Thank Once you. again, thanks very much, Carl.